everyone. I'm Zach Kucharski. I'm the executive editor at the Gazette, and welcome to Iowa Ideas in Depth Week. And this week, uh, we are taking a look at children's mental health. And so uh, we have a week long uh, set of panels uh, starting with today's session that's the status of children's mental health in Iowa. And we will um, jump through a lot of topics today uh, and then dive into deeper depth uh, as we go throughout the week. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I want to thank our panelists, um, Peggy, Mary, uh, and Tanya will be joining us momentarily. Um, and we are uh, going to kind of get started here. Um, kind of some housekeeping matters before we get going. Um, you can submit questions using the, the Q&A button that's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, those questions will get submitted to us uh, and we will uh, work them in uh, to the conversation. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can do that throughout and I will work them in. Uh, we have a preset list of questions, uh, but we want to get to as many uh, as we possibly can uh, over the course of uh, the next 55 minutes. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, start with the introductions of the panelists. Uh, I'm going to have each uh, panelist introduce themselves because I think they'll do better at that than uh, if I tried to do that. Um, and, and so um, I'm going to start with Peggy uh, from NAMI. Uh, if you could kind of speak a little, uh, give a little introduction about your experience and your organization, and uh, we'll start there. You bet. Well, thanks for having, thanks for having us, Zach. Uh, I really appreciate the Gazette's uh, commitment to the Iowa Ideas Conference and these um, additional learning opportunities. Uh, may, it's just meant a game changer for Iowa and. I appreciate the Gazette's uh, corporate um, it's a, uh, commitment to this because it takes a lot of resources to organize these things and put them on. So thank you, Zach, and to his staff uh, for doing it. Um, children's mental health is something near and dear to my heart, both in my as my position as executive director for NAMI Iowa, that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But I'm also a mom um, to three adult children uh, two of whom, my two daughters, uh, both have dealt with mental health challenges for much of their lives. Um, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, ADD, um, and, and I've seen the effect that it's had on their life, their lives. And I also know that as a mom, uh, I feel guilt about what I should have known, what I should have done differently. Um, if, but what at NAMI we learn is we can only do what we know based on what we know. And so we're always trying to help people learn more um, and to empower them to, to do better. And so I'm very interested in this topic. I've been a member of the Children's Behavioral Health Board since it was formed three years ago. Um, Mary and I have both um, done that. Um, we, we get calls every day from parents from across the state who are desperately trying to help their kids in different circumstances. So, um, as I said, uh, it's a topic near and dear to my heart, and I want to thank you for addressing it. Thank you, Peggy. And Mary? Good. I wanted to say good morning, but good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Neubauer, and I'm a parent who lives in Clive. As Peggy just referenced, um, I serve on the Children's Behavioral Health System State Board. And uh, my husband Larry's and my um, journey into the mental health world um, really began when we adopted our son, Sergei, in Russia. And some folks may have heard of Sergei's story because, unfortunately, Sergei took his own life in late 2017 um, when he was 18 years old. And um, the cumulative impact of the trauma from his um, tumultuous and abusive childhood in Russia um, just really became too much for him to bear in those late teenage years, um, as, as Peggy has, has referenced with, with her daughter, Sergei, um, suffered from a number of mental health issues, uh, including severe uh, depression, anxiety, um, and PTSD related to his childhood in Russia. And when he died, um, we chose to be really open and honest about the impact that mental health had had on him. Because I think so many times when there is a suicide, folks are just left wondering, how could that have happened? What 
you know, what possibly could have led to that. And, and we thought it was really important to, to say exactly what had happened and why. We didn't realize at the time what we were starting uh, in terms of, you know, the, the calls that would come our way related to um, the information that we had shared. But I'm, I'm really hopeful and proud of the fact that I think we started, helped kickstart a conversation here in Iowa that hadn't been there before. And I think it's continuing today, even with, um, with webinars like this that, that the Gazette has organized. So thank you for that. Um, you know, we all just need to continue to talk about this because, you know, mental health is no different than physical health and we all need both of them to truly be well. So, um, you know, it's something that I continue to work on. As Peggy had said, this is something near and dear to my heart due to my family's own experience. And just as Peggy has referenced, we also continue to get calls from, from families today who are, who are desperately looking to help their children. And so we know there is more work to be done. Um, we have made progress, but there's more work to be done. So Zach, thank you for doing this today. No, and thank you both uh, for taking the time out of busy schedules. Um, this is a pertinent conversation anytime, but it's uh, really top of mind in the, in you know, the last few, uh, few weeks. Um, and I think it's a, a recurring um, conversation that the more resources we can put behind it, um, the, the better. Um, and so I, I, both of you had mentioned in the, the opening remarks, your participation in, uh, in the Children's Board. And I was kind of curious if you could bring us up to speed. This has been operating for a few years now, um, behind the scenes a little bit, more than I would like to admit, we should have done a better job covering it. Um, and, and so I'm, can you bring us up to speed um, where we are uh, in terms of the board's work and kind of focal points right now? Peggy, do you, I can, I can jump oh, in yeah. early and then, and then I know Peggy will have a lot of data to add in as well. So um, I had Peggy and I both have been involved in the Children's Behavioral Health System um, State Board over the last, I would say, five years. Um, there was another board that preceded the current one that really um, established Iowa's children's mental health system. And then the cur current board is continuing to monitor the developments within the system and the services that are, are available across the state. You know, prior to um, I believe it was 2019, Iowa didn't have a children's mental health system. And so um, there were, you know, perhaps services in different parts of the state, but it was really hard to quantify what those services were, how they were being made available. And so the idea of the children's behavioral health system is really to, um, to put services in place across the state so that you can get services close to home, no matter where you are. Um, I think some of the challenges that remain in Iowa um, are challenges that, that we're seeing across the country, and that is we have, a, we have a severe shortage of mental health professionals who are trained and qualified to work with children because there is additional um, training that, that is needed for folks who will specialize in, in working in children's mental health services. Um, and because there is that lack of providers, quite frankly, when you get into more rural areas of Iowa, you're seeing a more severe lack of services. And that's something that continues to be worked on. Have we made progress? Absolutely. But but we know that the, that the work is not done simply from the calls that Peggy and I have both referenced. Yeah, so I, I will add that um, it, it's been very gratifying. As Mary said, Iowa really did not have a children's mental health system. Uh, we still kind of honestly barely do. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress, but I appreciate the effort um, made through the Children's Behavioral Health Board because it really is trying to integrate um, with the state departments of uh, uh, human services and health and education and workforce development, um, all the different uh, uh, aspects of really building a children's mental health system, um, having some accountability, having, um, having j even just standard language for you know, what we mean by, you know, when we talk about certain services. Because uh, up until just a few years ago, and really even to some extent still, 
um, what kind of services you could receive completely dependent on where you lived um, and also what kind of insurance you have. And um, uh, there are some uh, pretty service rich areas of the state, Eastern Iowa, um, Polk County. And then there are other areas that are, um, have really very little. And that in our view is unacceptable. Um, access to services, especially in a crisis, should not depend on what zip code you, you live in. And that's something that Mary and I as advocates have um, emphasized. We've had a lot of parents um, speak to the board and tell their stories. Um, and it's been pretty eye-opening uh, hearing a lot of them. And actually, frankly, very sad at times. Um, seeing what parents have had to go through to try to get their child the help that they need. And frankly, if it was uh, a case of cancer or um, arthritis or our heart disease or any other kind of physical ailment, it probably would not have been such a struggle. Um, but given that it's a mental health challenge, it has been. So uh, I'm happy to see the uh, multidisciplinary approach. Um, the board just went through a big strategic planning process last year um, and solidified some um, strategic goals. And I particularly want to um, call out and acknowledge the, um, the dedication of Kelly Garcia, the director of the Department of Human Services, and also now soon it'll be Department of Health and Human Services uh, combined, because she really, um, she really gets the importance of this. And uh, she has dedicated a lot of her own time, along with a lot of her staff's time, to making sure that this work moves forward. And um, I, I'm optimistic about the future, although I wish things would go faster as an advocate. Um, they certainly have been um, moving ahead toward the day when any parent will be able to access the need, help that they need when they need it anywhere in the state. That's our goal. The, uh, the other, Zach, I'll just add in the other sea change moment that is occurring and has been occurring over the last um, year and then into the coming year is, is a wholesale funding change in terms of um, mental health funding here in Iowa. Um, it had been a, ta a property tax-based system um, and for really fast growing counties like the one I live in, which is Dallas County or um, Lynn County or Johnson County, those counties were constantly having trouble keeping up with the demand for mental health services and the cost of mental health services because as we all know, property taxes are paid in arrears. And so as new folks were moving into the counties, the, the funding stream wasn't keeping up. So um, last year and this year, uh, the changed to state funds, which will allow fast-growing counties to keep up better in terms of the demand versus. I, I think that the ahead is advocates all have to continue to make sure that 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 mental health services are, are a priority. Um, if, if that's not the case, then, then folks might not be able to receive the help that they need if funding isn't available. So that's definitely going to be part of the story as we move ahead. But, but as someone who has been part of this conversation, I think it's a good change um, because it was just going to continue to be something that wasn't working the best um, without that funding stream change. It just on that topic of the funding stream change, is is this more stable, um, you know, or is there concern that, you know, it's going to be a urban rural divide of some of those counties that will be able to fund more where the growth is happening? What is the concern there? Well, I, I've heard a lot of discussion about that, and certainly property taxes are usually a very uh, stable source of funding. Um, but the problem with the mental health property tax levy is that it had two different limits on it. It had a dollar limit for each county and statewide, and it had um, a per, um, per capita limit. And so 
counties were really stuck either way. If you were a fast growing county, you were a lot of those counties like Polk County, for example, for eight years could not raise their their property, mental health property tax um, levy because they were stuck uh, at the dollar limit. Um, so their per capita was far below what it could have been because they were growing. And that would that's true of any any of the fast faster growing counties. But for the for the counties that are actually losing population, they were stuck at the per capita limit. And so um, it, it was really a conundrum. And then you would have counties that um, within the regions, we have 14 regions that um, in any given year, they went down, they went, they went down to zero in their levy uh, for different reasons. And so there was a lot of, a lot of um, consternation and, um, and problems even within regions uh, as to what counties were levying. Um, and there was a lot of, of uh, conflict are just around the funding formula and strategy. And we really came to the conclusion that uh, we were not going to be able to advance the system until the funding changed. And so now with um, the state, uh, as of July 1 of next year, we'll be at 100% funding um, the mental health and disability regional system uh, that's about 125, 130 million dollar um, commitment, and um, I give full credit to the governor and to the legislature. So far, they have lived up to their commitment. Um, we hope that that will continue to be the case, um, because, as Mary said, um, it's hard to uh, fulfill the promises and come through with the uh, programs and services if the funding is not there. And uh, we're just trusting legislators and the governor to, um, to complete that uh, commitment and to follow through with the funding. Um, and, and also the commitment that we're not sure how much this children's system is actually going to cost uh, when it's fully built out, which it is not, um, that they will uh, follow that commitment to make sure that the appropriate amount of funding is there year after year. One of the things, and, and you mentioned this uh, in, in some of the opening remarks, was getting the same language and using some of the same language. Um, and, and one of the things uh, that's been in place, and we'll have a session on this, is about screening panels. Um, but I wanted to ask about kind of that standard process or that universal screening tool. And how important is that to kind of, when you have a patchwork system like children's mental health is, to, to have a similar tool? And how important was that uh, to the board? You know, the, the topic of, of universal screening from, from the mental health side, you're exactly right, Zach. Um, you know, we're screening kids for um, vision. We're screening kids for um, audio visual to make sure that, that kids can hear. Um, and so the board had had conversations Scoli about um, being <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, so many things that, that we're already screening kids for. And so the board had had conversations about trying to add mental health screening um, to that process because there are things to look for. And as with any medical condition, the earlier that you provide help and intervention, the better the possibility for the outcome. Um, I, I will say that, that the topic of universal screening has been very controversial. However, there were questions about um, who would be in charge of doing the screening, um, how it would be done, how it would be paid for. Um, and so, so far, um, you know, screening, universal screening is not occurring in schools um, by and large. There is screening going on, however, you know, certainly family physicians offices are doing screening and um, in situations where screening is being requested um, through school systems, certainly, certainly that can be done. Uh, but that, that is a conversation that, that I think is still ongoing and is important, again, just from the aspect that 
that the sooner you can get there, the better the, the outcome will be for the child. And that's that's the same as if you had a broken arm or, you know, as Peggy had mentioned, heart disease or cancer, it's it's all the same thing. The brain is an organ, just like the heart, the liver, the kidneys, it's all the same thing. Um, one of the questions that we had uh, from the audience, um, and I think it comes from an ER manager of a critical access hospital, we struggle weekly with younger and younger age children in crisis with very few places for them to go. We've had 10-year-old kids as long as 10 days in our ER, um, and, and I'm curious, is this some of the some of the stories that you're hearing um, that are making their way to the board, um, and, and when you were talking about that rural-urban divide or just even the, the beds available, is that getting better? And are there places of concern uh, around the state at this point still? Peggy, you go first and then I'll jump in. Um, unfortunately, in the short term, it has not gotten better. Uh, that's just the honest answer. The pandemic has um, affected um, most healthcare systems negatively. 20% uh, of the healthcare workforce has, has left, uh, retired, quit, um, gone. And um, most uh, health systems are, are running sh chronically short-staffed. And uh, unfortunately, behavioral health is a money loser. And uh, so, um, and, you know, people who go to behavioral health care uh, inpatient units sometimes have... Um, troubling behavior. And so for all those reasons, um, what we've seen a precipitous decline in uh, available inpatient beds, um, but that's only part of the problem because although a lot of people think that more beds is the answer, it isn't necessarily. There's a lot of really effective community-based treatments that can be implemented, but unfortunately they're they're also all full. Um, there's a particular um, dearth of treatment options for kids who have both an intellectual disability or developmental disability and a uh, serious emotional disorder. Um, there's only a handful of those programs and they're constantly full. So in a lot of cases, as Mary experienced, parents have to send their kids out of state um, and that is not the, um, the best way to do things. You know, you don't want a kid to be hundreds or thousands of miles away from their home while they're undergoing treatment. Um, but unfortunately we, we don't have the facilities and programs here in the state that meets the needs of some of these kids, but to the point of, you know, being in an emergency department for 10 days, I mean, can you imagine being in that situation, um, it's horrible. It's horrible for everyone involved, uh, the parents, the kid, and the, st and the staff um, who are there trying their best to um, get a good outcome for, the, for that family. And uh, it's heartbreaking, honestly. We, we need to do better. We need to have um, crisis services available, effective crisis services, for specifically for children, which we do not have now. Um, we need to have um, places where they can be stabilized and assessed, not in an emergency room. Um, and then we need to have places for them to go, whether, if, whether they need an inpatient bed, which is honestly the minority of patients, whether they need maybe a subacute um, five day stay somewhere or, or they could return home or to a um, community-based um, program that is, but that is sufficient to really meet their needs. And that's not, that's not once a month, one hour um, therapy session for most kids. They need more than that. So um, we, as Mary said, uh, we still have a long way to go. And yes, there definitely is disparity uh, within the state um, one third of our counties have no mental health treatments, uh, clinicians at all, let alone ones that, um, are, are pediatric. So, um, 
we don't have enough clinicians, we don't have enough beds, we don't have enough programs. Um, and unfortunately, the pandemic in the short term has made that worse. Yeah, Zach, I would I would say I feel like we've been we've been running to even stay in place. Um, but even though we're running as fast as we can, the pandemic just slammed everyone, right? I mean, even us as adults, it was a really difficult time and it's been difficult um, in the months and perhaps a year now that we've come out of it. And I think some folks have the mindset, well, the pandemic is done, everything's going to be fine now. Um, things aren't going to be fine now. You know, this was a really traumatic life up ending situation for all of us, but especially for kids at really critical times as their brains were developing and their social skills were developing and, and that got interrupted and things like that stick with children for years. Um, and, and so, so the, the need has been increasing quite frankly faster than we have been able to build the services here in Iowa. So even though strides have been made, I still feel like we're falling behind simply because the need is so great, especially on the children's side. And you know, when when we were looking for help for our son um, five years ago, as Peggy has referenced, we we turned to the experts, to the folks who were in the hospital when he was hospitalized at the height of his crisis, and we said. Where can he go here in Iowa? Obviously, he needs more help than we have been able to provide him so far. And the answer was, we don't know. We There are great programs out there, but you will have to find them. And as a parent in that situation where you're already so stressed because your child is deathly ill, and then to hear that, th that they don't know where your child can go to get the help, it was, I can't even describe it, but it was heartbreaking. It was frightening. It was every um, adjective that I, that I can put to the situation. And, and we know there are still folks in, in that situation today. For the provider who asked the question, I would say um, the Your Life Iowa website is a great resource. Um, and that's the website from the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services. Certainly that's someplace that, that they could try to call to see if, if folks there could help them come up with um, with a bed solution for, for that child. Um, and there are some new behavioral health hospitals here in Iowa, Clive Behavioral Health here in the Des Moines area, and there's a new behavioral health hospital over in the Quad Cities as well. Now, for a lot of folks, that may be a long ways away, but at least it could be an emergency answer um, in the short term while they continue to hopefully work on longer term plans. I just wanted to interject here that um, part of the, the pandemic is, has been one a very sig significant source, of course, of uh, interruption in our, in our quest to get a good children's behavioral health system. But we all have to recognize that we have been through some collective trauma over the last two plus years. Uh, the pandemic, of course, is part of it. But in Iowa, you know, we went through the Derate Show um, two years ago, which was, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess now it's happening more often, but I never heard of it before it came right over our house in Johnston. Um, and then we had perhaps the most contentious election in the American history of America that was not over on Election Day, um, but continued on and on. Um, and continues to go on. Uh, and then we had um, the war in Ukraine, uh, which is something that has been very uh, concerning and, and even watching from afar for a lot of people. Um, and, and then just recently, the spate of gun violence. Um, these are all things that kids know about and understand and think about and are afraid of. And um, another one I hear frequently is climate change. Um, you talk to a lot of young people who, who believe that they are not going to live to be older adults um, because the planet isn't going to be able to sustain life that long. And so these are real, um, these are real things that, um, that young people are grappling with um, every day. And we as the caring adults in their lives need to recognize that and to um, take it seriously.
Absolutely. And, and I, I think, you know, it hits home. I have an 11 and a nine year old. And so when you start to have to answer school shooting questions, or you have to answer some of these questions, I mean, watching a nature, you know, series on Netflix uh, pre- presents some of those questions and, and you haven't thought of those and, and it is, I mean, I think you are dealing with a lot of uncertainty, um, you know, as simple as driving past the gas station and understanding that gas is 460 something a gallon um and and they they understand that cost and so that means something in a lot of families um and and so i i think there is a high level of of angst that's that's present um and continues to be present um i am curious um you know as we talk about you know integrations um at the board level you've had quite a bit of inter uh, action with um with Director Garcia, but also in the Department of Education. I'm curious, is that trickling down to the level that you need it to um, partnerships in individual districts and individual schools? And and how could those resources be uh, further developed because of, you know, in, in normal circumstances, kids spend a lot of time at school. Uh, the pandemic maybe was the variant of that, um, but, you know, are, are those partnerships taking place or is that another layer of the system that um, needs additional work? That's, that's something that has, that has been worked on, Zach. And that's a really good question though, because we have services being provided by the state's mental health regions, which Peggy referenced in one of her answers. Then um, we have the school districts themselves, and then we have education area agencies. Um, and, and those are three very different systems. And um, not all of the service areas are the same. You know, you have some school districts that span more than one mental health region, or you have some school districts that may span more than one area education agency. And so part of the work of the board is trying to get all of those entities to do a better job of talking to each other and and coordinating services. Um, You know, as Peggy said, and, and, and as I would say, as an advocate, I wish things would move more quickly. Now, certainly you want things to be deliberate and you want um, things to, to get it right, right. When you're developing services, but, but it's just, it's such slow going. Certainly the pandemic was part of that because for a while, none of us could leave our houses and talk to each other and have the strategic meetings that we needed. Um, But I would say, quite frankly, a lot of these um, conversations and service developments are still very much still in development. That's not a bad thing because we are talking about it and we are working on it, but um, it just from me as an advocate, it remains, it remains slower than I would like. There was a very large and concerted conversation um, during this past legislative session that just ended about workforce needs, about loan forgiveness for mental health care providers, about um, trying to establish new um, psychiatric residencies at the University of Iowa, trying to get more providers to come here to Iowa to get their education and then hopefully to practice, um, to um, trying to establish tiered reimbursement for hospitals so that they would receive um, greater income for caring for those who have the greatest mental health needs. Um, So all of that is very much being talked about and is being worked on. It's just, it's slower than I would like. And I saw a question come in from someone I had referenced a website earlier. I'll just, I'll give the full address now um, so that everybody can see it. It's www.yourlifeiowa.org. And that um, is a website that's currently um, hosted by the Iowa Department of Public Health. We'll be transitioning to um, health and human services, but that's a website with a lot uh, of resources and contact information where folks can call if they are looking for help with mental health um, services. Um, I'll just say I agree with I agree with Mary. It's it's not enough fast enough from our perspective, but things are slowly uh, improving. Uh, the Department of Education hosted a, a great. Um, uh, statewide meeting last fall in November uh, about school-based mental health services. And they had over 2,000 people uh, from around the state attend. And that was so great to see all the interest on the part of educators. 
uh, and just being able to spend time with them and listen to what's going on and um, what their needs are. And uh, what I heard is that a lot of teachers and, and administrators both are, are really desperate for resources and help struggling with some pretty severe and serious behavioral health issues in the classroom, uh, feeling like they don't are not equipped uh, to deal with them. So uh, obviously there's a huge need for that as witnessed by the attendance. And, um, and we were told that's going to be an annual thing. So I really hope that it is. And I also um, hope that the support is uh, ongoing from the Department of Education and the area education agencies which really have been charged with um, providing the support to the schools. Um, I know that NAMI offers a program uh, called Ending the Silence. It's a 50 minute uh, program that's presented by a main presenter and a young adult who shares their story. And um, we've just, we presented at the Iowa Association of School Boards State Convention in November and were inundated with requests to do the program. And uh, we delivered it to over 3,000 people just in the first quarter of this year. Uh, and we're on track to reach over 12,000. And I'll just tell you, Zach, that when I started with NAMI six years ago, um, we were trying to launch Ending the Silence nationally. And I approached a lot of education groups and a lot of school districts. And I was told, we don't need that program. We don't have that problem. Um, things have changed a lot in six years. Um, school districts, school personnel now are pretty open about want, needing the help and wanting the help and dealing with it. And the pandemic certainly had a role in that because so many more people are now affected by depression and anxiety, and they're willing to um, talk about it. Um, and they're willing to, um, and especially young people are much more willing to be transparent about that. And they're asking for help. So that's a good thing. And um, so I'm very encouraged by that. But uh, we need to do more telehealth. We need to have more school-based services. Um, there, there's a lot of needs out there. Um, my hope is in the young people really demanding it uh, and in school districts being much more open to delivering it. I wanted to ask a little bit, um, time goes very quickly here. Um, and, and so um, one of the points that I think is, is unique about children's mental health and it, you're dealing with kids. And so there's, there's a whole support network um, and that, that maybe needs to be handled a little bit differently, or maybe there isn't a, the, the support network that needs to be there. Um, and, and I was curious how much of the board's work is kind of looking at, you know, whether it's parents or kind of helping people, um, you know, the support network learn what it needs to do for positive outcomes. Uh, and, and are those programs, I, mean, I, I think we're starting to hear more and more about that, um, but it, it feels like, you know, the Your Life Iowa is one resource. Are there other kind of crash course learning experiences that are being thought of? Absolutely, yes. Um, again, it's um, it's perhaps slower than I would like, but but I I feel like we're getting there. One of one of the first conversations that the board had, Zach, um, was about. Um, emergency services in terms of dealing with kids in crisis and um, just knowing that sometimes if the main people responding are law enforcement, um, that can be frightening to, to a child. If everyone who shows up, you know, has uniforms on and, um, you know, perhaps inter interacts with the, the child in a different way. And so, or interacts with the child that way. And so th there's been a conversation about having emergency teams put together and those are being put together. And there are some already in place here in Iowa that would have you know, perhaps school um, officials involved in the emergency response, social workers involved in the emergency response and certainly law enforcement as well, but just trying to make sure that there is a, there is a mix of people who would be on that emergency team that would respond. And there are those emergency teams um, in place right now. I'm also especially encouraged 
that, that many law enforcement agencies are, are now putting in place um, social, social workers, social services specialists um, within their departments to help be um, that emergency response and to ensure that the right kind of response is given. So there has been a lot of really positive, um, positive developments in that area. I'm really proud of that because I think I think that's a great starting point um, because you know you want to you want to first reach the folks who are perhaps most in crisis and then build back from there in terms of additional services. Um, that can help. Yeah, and that's that's a great question, Zach. Um, you can't you can't treat a child in isolation. They're they're part of a family unit. Um, re, you know, regardless of what that family group looks like. Um, and I'll tell you that um, it's really that's part of what makes it more challenging is that you can't just treat the child in isolation. Um, so having the family involved is critical and, uh, I'll just offer that NAMI does have a class for parents of, uh, young children called NAMI basics, um, to learn about the illness and how to be supportive. Um, and that is actually available on demand, uh, online. Um, and, and we have support groups, uh, that meet regularly, uh, for parents, um, so we try to, we try to provide that. Um, I can't tell you how many parents, um, uh, my age, uh, like my, my younger daughter, who's now 30, uh, was seven when she was first diagnosed. Um, and she started therapy at age seven. Um, <clears throat> my frequent refrain is if I, if I had only known, if I had only known, and I thought of myself as a pretty educated um, not, you know, I read lots of stuff and everything, but I did not get what she was going through at all until much later. And I wish that I had, because I know I could have been a lot more helpful to her at that time, but that's our aim is to help educate parents, um, to, uh, not to be, um, um, uh, uh, enablers, but supporters to truly um, understand what that child is going through um, is, is crucial. And I'll say that the need is particularly great uh, for foster and adoptive parents. Um, a lot of parents like Mary and Larry uh, who adopted kids, not just through foreign adoptions, but domestic as well. Those children come from uh, trauma. Uh, there's a lot of abuse and neglect that um, the damage is done by the age of two. And um, we've heard countless stories from uh, foster and adoptive parents of, uh, if I had only known, if I had only known, they were completely unprepared and ill-equipped uh, for dealing with um, things that often don't come out until later um, in the child's life. And uh, we as a state could do much better in helping. Um, uh, I think foster and adoptive parents are, are angels. Uh, they're taking on so much. We could do a much better job of equipping them and helping and supporting them to do, for, to do that role. During the pandemic, what we saw is a lot of kids going back to institutions because foster and adoptive parents said, I can't do this anymore. I didn't sign up to be a 24 seven parent and I can't do it. So, um, and Kelly Garcia talks about that very, um, very candidly uh, about how heartbreaking it is to see that happen. Uh, so we, we have to, as I said, we have to do better. We had hoped to have Director Garcia on this week, um, scheduling conflicts, but also you, both of you have made the point of not as fast as I would like, um, and, and I don't hand out compliments to committees very often, but in reading the, the annual reports that the board has done, um, I would encourage everybody to, to read um, kind of the accounting of the work that you've done on those boards because you're starting to see pieces really come together. And so, um, kudos to the team that is working across the state and coming together to do that. Um, you know, I, 
oftentimes you look at those reports and they don't tell you a whole lot. Um, these actually do. Um, and so to everyone who's participating, um, I would encourage you to check out the, the board annual reports and some of the minutes and um, there's a lot, a lot of information there and a lot of examples and kind of the things bubbling up. Um, and, and I was curious, you know, I, I, um, I want to kind of ask the, you know, in the, the year ahead, um, obviously COVID threw some curveballs, um, but if, if there were some measures or, or some pieces that you really want to focus on in the next year, um, what would those pieces be? Um, and, you know, are there partnerships that you would like to see come together? Are there barriers that you would like to see blown up? What What's kind of that next step of, you know, we're doing the work, we're climbing the mountain, if only. One of the, a few, a few things come to mind, Zach. Um, so, so first of all, something that, that is already underway, I give huge kudos to the law enforcement community for doing this is crisis intervention training for, for law enforcement. So, so that law enforcement officers are best equipped and have um, the best information when they're responding to folks of all ages who are having mental health crises. So that is already underway, but I, I'm seeing um, more uh, mental health regions across the state really step up and want to be part of that training um, to, as I said, to best equip our law enforcement first responders, um, all of those folks who are the ones who are called when, when there's a crisis. I think that's huge. Um, I, I mentioned um, some of the legislation that had passed this year, but um, Peggy, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe um, the bills are actually signed into law yet. So we continue to watch those, but the mental health um, loan repayment programs, I think we need to um, watch those be implemented, hopefully, and then see the impact of that. Because if we can um, get more loan, loan repayment um, programs in place, hopefully that would be an incentive for more folks to come here to Iowa, to practice here in Iowa, and to stay in Iowa. So I want to see that happen. And then we talked about tiered reimbursement for hospitals. We'll um, put a program that enable hospitals to offer more capacity for caring folks who, who have the severe health needs. Um, all of that things that will come together. And then um, as a board member, I've been having some conversations. Bear with the background noise. There's a big thunderstorm moving over my area right now. Um, I've been having conversations with folks about wanting um, to to make sure that that we're talking about specific uh, reimbursement rates that can be improved for mental health providers. Again, to try to encourage more folks um, to practice here in Iowa. Okay, thank you, Mary. All part of that conversation. Peggy, please jump in. Uh, yeah, there is a big, big, another big thunderstorm moving through our area. So uh, yeah, I think it's right over, right over Mary right now. Um, I want to, I wanted to highlight uh, related to CIT, um, a major opportunity that I see happening soon, and that is the advent of 988. Um, 988 is a three-digit uh, number that uh, starting July 16th, people are going to be able to call uh, for help with behavioral health crises. Um, and uh, we have Your Life Iowa, which is great, but you know nobody can remember that number. Um, and this is a, a three-digit number that anyone can call and get uh, help. And there's also gonna be a text, a text line for people who feel more comfortable texting. Um, and um, this is going to be uh, run by the providers who are now doing Your Life Iowa and the National Suicide Prevention uh, Helpline Foundation 2 in Cedar Rapids and Community in Iowa City. And they're excellent, excellent providers. Uh, we're in really good hands with them. Um, and they're building their capacity to be able to handle what they anticipate to be a pretty significant increase in volume. So well, there's that, but then also building out the in-person crisis response um, that it's only needed for between one and 5% of, of callers are gonna need in-person 
uh, response, but for those who need it, they need it. And um, just uh, seeing more and more, this is also a very helpful thing for me, not only law enforcement being trained in CIT, which is great, um, but it's really difficult for a lot of law enforcement because they are trained, it is inbred in them to do the command and control. They come into a situation and they're supposed to command and control it. Um, and that is not the best approach to take within a behavioral health crisis, especially not with kids. So more and more we see non-law enforcement uh, crisis response being developed. And kudos to Foundation Two for working on that um, in their counties that they serve. Also, the Ireland Ball in North Central Iowa has been doing it. Um, we just did, learned that Broadlawns is doing a, a partnership with uh, the Des Moines Police here in Polk County. Um, I think that we're seeing it more and more nationally. Uh, we know that it can work. Um, and I think that it's going to be a really good thing because um, it, these are, are being able to dispatch people who are trained in how to react in that crisis situation, de-escalate it, um, and to hopefully prevent that person from becoming justice involved uh, or even really having to go to the emergency room. They're able to deal with it right then and there and then refer the person on to appropriate um, community-based services, that's the best thing for everyone. So, but, and uh, what I hope to see eventually is for these non-law enforcement crisis response to be going to schools rather than law enforcement, because um, uh, a uniform badge and gun uh, is usually not the best uh, way to resolve a uh, behavioral health crisis in a school setting. So. Uh, hoping, hopeful that we're going to be seeing much more of that. It, just, just a question while I have you in the waning minutes here. Um, are, there are quite a few, um, you know, schools that share guidance counselors or share counseling services or, you know, Mary, you made the point of the AEAs. And I think that's frequently a kind of the on-demand uh, service provided from the AEAs. Um, is there going to be a push to put more mental health, you know, train uh, services in schools or is that is that something that the board's been talking about or you know one of, one of the major pieces of legislation that was passed early on was um, legislation to for the first time um, provide um, trauma-informed care training and uh, suicide awareness suicide prevention training for teachers um, so that has been in place for for a few years now that that's just one hour of training per year that's required but there hadn't been that requirement before so I, I think that's that's a really good thing and we have heard teachers just just crying out for this training and saying they want more resources available certainly um, another big part of the conversation has been, um, more nursing staff and more social services staff um, in schools. That all comes down to funding. It all comes down to priorities. And so I think for folks who are concerned about this issue, you have to continue to make your voice heard. And I know it gets tiring and I know it gets hard because to say well, we've already had this conversation. Yes, I know, but we need to continue to have this conversation um, or it won't be clear to those making the decisions how great the need is and how important it is that these services be put in place. Yeah, I think that um, if we look at the state of Minnesota, Zach, um, they are ahead of us in this area. Um, they have a really excellent school-based uh, behavioral mental health uh, system, school-based therapy um, for families, uh, for kids, a lot of really great stuff uh, happening that we could learn from. Um, and also I have to say that NAMI does have resources too. We have a class called Provider. Uh, it's a four hour or 15 hour class that teaches the collaborative model of care um, to put that empathy back into understanding what someone is going through that could be appropriate for school nurses, uh, for uh, guidance counselors, uh, people in the school setting. So the more we can do to educate uh, advocate and build empathy. Um, kids are not being bad a lot of times on purpose. They're not, they're not acting out just to make your life hell. Um, they often, there's a reason for why that behavior is appearing. 
And uh, as a caring adults, we need to get to why and how to help them. All right. Well, Peggy and Mary, thank you very much. And to our audience of participants, I appreciate you uh, joining us for the kickoff of Iowa Ideas In-Depth Week, uh, looking at children's mental health. Um, and so we'll continue that Tuesday with family and navigating the system. Wednesday is intakes um, and assessment diagnosis. Thursday is children's mental health and law enforcement in the courts. And then Friday, we look at in schools. Um, on behalf of the Gazette, thank you for participating uh, with us today and joining us. Uh, and we look forward to uh, future Iowa Ideas projects coming up uh, later for the conferences in October. Uh, and we'll have much more information at iowaideas.com. So on behalf of everyone here today, thank you for taking time. Uh, have a great day. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Peggy.